Hello and welcome to lecture 15 of our fantastic classical mechanics course. Today we're going to be talking about Euler angles. There are three of them and they are designed in order to describe a position or rather orientation of a body in three-dimensional space. So how would we um, come up with a way of describing that position. Well, one way that the Euler angle approach chooses to do that is to describe the position of a coordinate system relative to its fiducial one. So, suppose that we start with uh, our favorite three-dimensional coordinate system, uh, where this is the x-axis, that is uh, the y-axis, and this is the z-axis. And uh, we would like to rotate it in some way so that we get a new orientation of this coordinate system which represents the new position of the body that we would like to de describe. So you can think of a body uh, being skewered by these axes and so if these axes rotate, the body rotates. So we will be discussing passive uh, transformations that describe the rotation of the axis uh, of the coordinate system. Uh, but the way we're going to rotate this body is going to consist of three parts, one part per each of the Euler angles. And the first rotation that we're going to perform uh, will be in the xy plane uh, by an angle phi. So in this plane, we're going to perform the rotation and we're going to get uh, a new coordinate system where the coordinates will have earned a prime. So these angles are all phi, and uh, as you may have guessed, the z-axis stays the same because it's a rotation around the z-axis, um, and uh, uh, the only changes in coordinates are that we now have a new x prime and the new y prime axis. So if we uh, would like to describe the uh, net rotational matrix that comes out of this, uh, so that will be the final rotational axis A. Uh, the first rotation that we're going to apply is going to be AZ, so it's rotation about the Z axis by an angle phi. And there will be two more rotations that we're going to uh, multiply this matrix by uh, to complete the full uh, three-dimensional rotation. Okay, so that's good. Uh, let's now move ahead uh, with the next step in uh, uh, our Euler angle rotations. And we're now going to rotate everything about the x-axis by an angle theta. So around this x prime axis, we're going to rotate by an angle theta. So what that will do is uh, it will rotate in the y prime z prime plane, all of the coordinate axis so this is going to be our uh, new z double prime and uh, uh, this is going to be our new y double prime so this is going to be angle theta that is going to be our angle theta and uh, x prime is going to be equal to x double prime because the rotation is occurring around the uh, new position of the x-axis or the x prime axis. So x prime stay the same and therefore it is equal to x double prime. And so that uh, rotation will be a theta, oh uh, sorry, of course not. So let me actually rewrite this a little bit over here. So the first rotation was yellow, so this will be around z by phi. And the next one will be a around x by theta. Great. So we still need to complete our last and third uh, rotation. And uh, that one will be somewhat counterintuitively a rotation around the new position of the z axis. So we would rotate about the z axis by an angle psi. Uh, I'm not going to be showing the new positions of uh, x and y axis because 
it's kind of confusing to draw that. Uh, that rotation will be happening in the x uh, double prime y double prime frame uh, plane. Uh, so z double prime is equal to z uh, triple prime. And our net rotational matrix that we're going to end up with is going to be a rotation around the new uh, position of the z-axis by an angle psi. So that is the sequence of three rotations uh, by each of the three Euler angles. Um, the physical meaning of each of these uh, will become clear. Uh, all I will say is that uh, this one is precession. Uh, this one uh, is uh, nutation. And the last one uh, is spin. And we will take a look at examples uh, that uh, help us understand better what exactly is uh, going on. Uh, of course, uh, when we are writing down this uh, sequence of transformations, um, we can, of course, write it down in the matrix form. So each of these uh, is a rotational matrix. This one is a rotational matrix around the z-axis, this one around the x, and this one, uh, again, around the z-axis. So let me try and see if I can squeeze uh, something over here uh, that will be helpful for us uh, to visualize that. So let's talk about the rotation uh, about the um, about the z axis first by the angle phi. So that would be uh, a matrix uh, that uh, you know does the rotation in the x y plane so that it doesn't touch the z axis, uh, and so the matrix looks just like that so that it's not touching. Uh, the Z coordinate, but it does touch the X and Y coordinate. So this looks like a standard a rotational matrix. So if you take this upper left quadrant, uh, it looks just like the two-dimensional rotational matrix that we previously considered. Then this one uh, will be multiplied uh, by uh, the AX of theta. So this one will look like that. And because we are rotating around the X axis, we now are going to have the same exact uh, 1, 0, 0 uh, along the x-axis. So only the yz subspace will be affected by the rotation. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, this um, upper left quadrant here will travel and become the lower right quadrant, except that now we're dealing with rotation by an angle theta. So it'll be cosine theta, uh, sine theta, minus, oh, minus sine theta, minus sine theta, and cosine theta here in the corner. Okay, great. So that is our uh, AX matrix, and that is our AZ matrix. Finally, we have the last uh, rotation around the latest position of the Z axis, which we represent by the final rotational matrix, and uh, that will uh, be exactly the same matrix as this one, but uh, with phi replaced by psi. So it will be cosine psi, sine psi zero, and then here we will have minus sine psi and cosine psi. Uh, we can perform all of this multiplication and uh, draw one big resulting matrix over here. And uh, what we're going to end up with is uh, cosine psi times cosine phi minus cosine theta times sine phi times sine psi. Um, cosine psi sine phi plus cosine theta cosine phi sine psi sine psi and sine theta over here. So this is one term, second term, third term. I'm getting a little bit tight here in space. I apologize for that. So we will have cosine psi and sine theta over here and cosine theta over there. Um, then in the second line, we're going to get minus sine uh, psi cosine phi 
um, minus cosine theta sine phi cosine psi minus sine psi up uh, a uh, sine phi plus cosine theta cosine phi and cosine psi here we're going to get sine theta sine phi and over here minus sine theta cosine phi so that is how our, our net rotational matrix looks like and let me move this x a little bit out of the way just so it doesn't look like it's part of our uh, rotational matrix awesome uh, so you can read more on this uh, in Goldstein chapter 4.9 Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to try and uh, figure out how to rewrite uh, the uh, rotational vector omega of the angular velocity of the rotation uh, in terms of uh, the different coordinates uh, here. Uh, we have done three rotations. There are three different coordinate systems, uh, actually four different coordinate systems, right? Uh, x, x prime, uh, x double prime, and x triple prime. Uh, so we would like to understand how to express uh, the components of omega in terms of all of these uh, different uh, coordinates. And that is what we're going to do in the next section, 15.2. Uh, and I'm going to see you there. Thanks and bye. Don't forget to do the quiz. Hello. And welcome to part two of lecture 15, 15.2. Uh, uh, here in this uh, second part of the lecture, we're going to take it one step closer to uh, computing uh, the equations of motion of a rigid body. And uh, the problem we're interested in is, well, um, let us try and write down the equations of motion uh, in the system of coordinates that is actually rotating with the body itself, like, uh, Let's say we would like to understand how Earth rotates. So we're going to define x, y, and z axis that are stuck with the Earth. And as Earth rotates, the axes don't change their position relative to the Earth. So it is in these axes that we would like to write down equations of motion. So let's call those axes primed axis. So if we have our body that looks something like this, um, we're going to orient... Uh, the set of axes uh, in a way that makes it easiest to describe the shape of the body. So if the body is kind of axis symmetric, let's uh, align our z prime axis along the axis of symmetry. Uh, the two uh, other axes, uh, x, x prime and y prime, uh, perpendicular to that. And so uh, just to reiterate, uh, the uh, x prime, y prime, and z prime axis are coordinates fixed in the body. Uh, and x, y, and z are uh, uh, left frame coordinates. Um, and so our goal is to get equations of motion for uh, a body that rotates around a fixed point, uh, like over here. So uh, for that, we will need to compute our kinetic energy, right? Because it enters into the Euler-Lagrange equations. And uh, we will see that for that, uh, we will need to write something like um, t is equal to one half i omega squared, where i will end up being the moment of inertia. Uh, we don't know that yet, but I'm kind of writing it down to give us an idea that if we have an angular frequency or angular velocity omega, uh, it uh, can give us kinetic energy similar to the regular velocity, except instead of one half mv squared, we're going to write one half i omega squared. And so uh, what we will need to do is to find uh, what is this omega in the uh, primed coordinate system and the coordinate system that is moving together with the body, not the lab system. And so if we were to write down omega, and we can represent omega, we can break it down into contributions of all the different three rotations that we wrote out down here, right? We had rotation that was associated with uh, 
phi. So we can compute what is the associated contribution to the angular frequency. Um, and then we can vector add that with uh, the corresponding contribution uh, due to uh, the second rotation by an angle theta. And finally, we can also add that uh, with the contribution from the third rotation by an angle psi. Uh, and at respective angular frequencies, phi dot, theta dot, and uh, psi dot. Because the system is linear, we can uh, consider all of those rotations independently and sum them up uh, in the end, uh, giving us the net angular uh, uh, velocity vector uh, omega. So now our goal is to go from uh, omega in the lab frame, uh, as we wrote down here, uh, to omega primes uh, in uh, the uh, frame associated with the axis in the body. Note that these primes are different than there, so apologies for the difference in notation. Uh, these primes here in that notation, those will be uh, x triple prime, y triple prime, and z triple prime. So this is the final um, body axis uh, after we've performed all the three of these uh, rotations. Just too many primes, I don't want to keep writing them out, so I'm going to drop all of them and just keep one uh, prime on the end. So uh, first off, uh, question, what is uh, omega phi dot prime? So what will be uh, the, uh, uh, the component of the omega vector um, uh, due to the associated with the rotation uh, by an angle phi uh, in the new, uh, in the coordinates associated with the body, in the body axis? Well, um, as before, uh, we're going to write down that omega prime is equal to uh, a um, times omega, uh, where a is the rotational matrix. But we don't need to rotate all three of these components um, by the same matrix. And that is because um, we've performed several rotations uh, one after the other. So first we perform the phi rotation, and that one actually will need to be multiplied by uh, a, a z of uh, psi uh, times a theta, oops, not theta, I don't know why I keep writing that, uh, times a x of theta, um, and uh, that's actually all we need to do uh, because these are the only matrices that are going to be affecting uh, the orientation uh, of the original z-axis around which this rotation was performed. So all of that we're going to multiply uh, by uh, the uh, omega, uh, which will be 0, 0, and phi dot. So this will be our omega phi dot. Uh, there is actually a little trick because, uh, of course, our original rotation by the phi angle does not change the original z-axis, uh, so that a z of phi times this is going to give us just the vector itself, uh, right? Uh, rotational matrix doesn't affect the uh, vectors along the rotational axis itself. And so uh, we can just stick this one in and as in the end, we're going to get the full rotational matrix uh, multiplying our uh, omega phi dot. Uh, and uh, we're going to get, if we multiply right over there, um, the full rotational matrix uh, by 0, 0 phi dot, we're going to plug out the last column of the matrix, and we're going to get that the result is sine theta, sorry, sine psi times sine theta, times cosine psi, uh, times sine theta, um, and uh, time, at the bottom we will have cosine theta. And all of that is going to be multiplied by phi dot. So that's uh, pretty great. And um, uh, if we now want to do the same thing uh, with uh, our second component, then uh, um, we'll be able to write this. 
And uh, you see that although our rotation is happening along the x-axis, so it's theta zero zero, um, this was done um, after the phi rotation has already been performed. Uh, and so we could write down, we can drop this one now. Actually, we have to drop this one now. And we could write this, right? But remember that this rotation doesn't affect any vector along the rotational axis about which this rotation happens. So we could actually drop this as it doesn't affect anything. Ax of theta acting on this will leave this vector intact. And so what we're going to have in the end, it's just a z of psi acting on our uh, omega uh, theta dot. And so that will be nothing but um, cosine uh, psi minus sine psi and zero multiplied by theta dot. Finally, the last but not the least, we're going to have to deal uh, with the rotation uh, uh, given by this uh, last rotational matrix, um, omega of psi dot. And uh, that will be given uh, by, um, you know, a z of psi times zero, zero psi dot. But then again, a z of psi doesn't do anything to this vector because a z of psi rotates everything about that vector and that vector stays the same. So we can throw it away and uh, end up with uh, just zero, zero, one times psi dot. So uh, we can now add all of these three and take a look at what is it that our omega prime, this one, uh, looks like uh, in terms of components. And that we will see uh, in the next part, 15.3, because obviously I've run out of space here and uh, I cannot write it anywhere here. So we have to move on. Please don't forget to do the quiz and I'm going to see you on the other side. Hello and welcome back to part three of lecture 15, where we are wrapping up uh, the description of rotation in terms of how angular velocity components are expressed in terms of the body axis. And right here, we just found how to break it down into contributions of each of the three different Euler rotations. Now, we're going to put it all together and write out what is our omega prime uh, in terms of uh, the three different components. And if we add up all the different contributions from omega uh, phi dot prime, omega theta dot prime, and omega psi dot prime from here, we're going to arrive at the following expression. It's going to be sine the psi sine theta times phi dot uh, plus cosine psi times theta dot, um, cosine psi, psi sine theta phi dot minus sine psi uh, times theta dot. And finally, at the bottom, we're going to have cosine theta uh, times phi dot plus psi dot. Uh, it's probably a very good moment for us to take a pause uh, and kind of uh, get an idea of what physically do each of these rotations mean. I kind of uh, gave you a preview of that, uh, but then again, the meaning of phi is precession. How does our body uh, axis change its orientation in space? So that is precession. Um, the uh, value of theta is notation. So how does the uh, axis of symmetry of the body, typically that's what it is, uh, bounces around. Um, and uh, finally, uh, this one is rotation. How does the body rotate around its symmetry axis? So what we have is we have precession, notation, and rotation on top of that. So rotation, 
together with precession and notation. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, we are actually going to be looking at that in much more detail. And now we are in a perfect position to start discussing the rigid body dynamics, which is uh, given in uh, section five of Goldstein for those who are interested in more detail. So what is it? Well, suppose that we have a three-dimensional body and it is spinning about its center of mass. So its center of mass is pinned down and uh, all the body can do is rotate around it uh, with some arbitrary angular velocity omega. So in this case, we can immediately make two key simplifications. Simplification number one is that the kinetic energy of the body will have only one term, not two terms. So typically, uh, the kinetic energy is the sum of the uh, center of mass kinetic energy plus the kinetic energy uh, related to the motion relative to the center of mass. But because the center of mass is pinned down, it's not going to go anywhere, uh, it means that uh, this term associated with the motion of the center of mass as a whole is zero. So we can drop it. The other simplification is that velocity is pure rotation. So it will be simply omega cross r. And so the velocity field, uh, we know uh, it's given by this. So uh, with these two key simplifications, uh, we can write down the kinetic energy, which is in our case is simply uh, TRCM as follows. Uh, TRCM is, of course, uh, as usual, the sum over all uh, little pieces of the body into which we break it down of uh, one half m uh, v squared. And uh, uh, that uh, we can uh, rewrite uh, by plugging in the velocity right here. And that will be um, equivalently that, right? We replaced each v with omega cross r and there is a dot product in between. So we can, of course, then simplify that even further. Uh, and the way we can do that is uh, by using the formula uh, that a cross b dot c uh, is equal to a dot b cross c. And so if we make use of that, uh, we are going to get uh, that this is equal to one half of m. So our a is omega. So it will be omega is sitting out and is dotted into b cross c, where that will be uh, this. It will be dotted into r cross omega r. So here we can use uh, another formula, uh, a cross b cross c, and that is equal to b times a dot c minus c dot a dot b. So uh, then we're going to get um, that this is equivalent to, we're replacing this double cross product uh, using back minus cab formula. So uh, first we get back, so B is omega uh, times R times R minus cab. So it will be C, uh, which is R, and then A dot B will be uh, omega times R. So it's omega times R then we can uh, take that omega into this product and uh, we're going to get as a result one half of the sum of uh, m omega squared r squared minus omega dot r times omega dot r 
And uh, here we can try and uh, massage this a little bit more. Um, let's uh, replace equivalently the terms over here. So this term will be equivalently written like that uh, times r squared. So what we've done, we have uh, said that omega squared is equal to omega i omega j times delta ij um, because uh, this summation is implied here. It is literally just omega squared. Uh, and uh, this term we will rewrite as simply omega i r i uh, times omega j r j, which is equivalent uh, representation of uh, dot product in components. Uh, and uh, this actually is uh, useful because we can now take out omega i and omega j. And uh, this doesn't depend on omega anymore. And uh, we denote this as iij, uh, which is the moment of inertia tensor. And uh, the result is that the kinetic energy can be written out simply as omega omega j times iij. And here, the moment of inertia tensor has a very simple form. So let's write it out. Because it is a tensor, uh, it's not a scalar, so it actually is a matrix. It's a 3 times 3 matrix. And uh, uh, this tensor is um, actually Right, it's a sum over m, so I need to include a sum over here. Um, and then uh, we multiply it by uh, this matrix, right? So it's a 3 times 3 matrix because i and j can go between 1 and 3. Um, and so if we are asking what happens for i equal j equal to x, so it will be x, x component of this uh, tensor, it will be r squared times delta x, x is 1 minus x x so it will be r squared minus x squared so that will be y squared plus z squared right so then uh, what happens here i x y if we plug in x for i and uh, y for j uh, delta i j delta x y vanishes and we end up with minus x y over here and uh, the last term over here will be in a very similar way minus xz. Uh, because this is a symmetric expression we can immediately mirror all of that and get that this will be minus xy and minus xz. Uh, Along the diagonal uh, we will have exactly the same kind of expressions so you see that this is ixx and it, it's missing x squared so here yy will be missing y squared so it will be uh, x squared plus z squared, and here at the bottom right, uh, it will be x squared plus y squared. And uh, uh, here in these two, uh, we will have minus yz uh, and uh, minus yz over here. So this is how our uh, moment of inertia tensor uh, looks like. And uh, there are a couple of notes that are useful to make over here. First is that iij, the, the, the moment of inertia tensor, is a property of the body. In other words, um, it doesn't depend on motion. That's because uh, when we rewrote it this way, we were able to take out everything that depends on the details of the motion, omega i and omega j, um, from uh, inside of this term, which is uh, the moment of inertia tensor. 
So moment of inertia tensor only depends on the distribution of masses um, in space. Uh, and uh, that's why it doesn't depend on the exact details of the motion the body performs. But, uh, of course, it depends on the choice of axis of the coordinate system, right? Because here we see that depending on uh, how we direct our coordinates within the body, x, y, and z, we're going to get different um, components um, in the various places in this matrix. So it depends on coordinate choice or the choice of axis uh, in the coordinate system. With that, let's move on to the next part of this lecture, 15.4, uh, where we will discuss how the components of the moment of inertia tends to transform when we go in between different uh, coordinate systems. Thank you for your attention. Don't forget to do the quiz. And I'm going to see you in the next part. Hello and welcome to part four of lecture 15 where are we going to ask a fundamental question? We have rotated the axis. How does our moment of inertia tensor change? How does it do that? So let's try and get at that. Well, in order to understand how does I change, uh, let us write down the definition of uh, coordinate transformation. And uh, that would be r prime is equal to a times r, where a is the rotational matrix. So in this case, uh, we can write out that i i j in the rotated coordinates is going to be simply the sum over m uh, of r prime squared delta ij minus r i prime r j prime. Let me see if I need to get the log, <laughs> let the dog in. Coleman, do you want to come here? Do you want to come here, buddy? Yeah, good boy. Good boy. Good boy. So one thing that we notice immediately is that rotation doesn't change the length of a vector. So r prime squared is equal to r squared. And uh, we can also, of course, uh, plug in the new values of r uh, in here. So what do we get in the end? We'll get that i i j prime uh, is going to be equal to the sum over uh, all the little masses r squared ij delta ij um, minus iik times rk right so we wanted to get ri prime that will be equal to a times r a a times r or in coordinates we will have the uh, Einstein sum over repeated indexes, which is k here. And similarly for j, we will have uh, ij, let's say, l times rl. So this too is that. Uh, now, uh, what we would like to do, as you probably imagine, we would like to somehow factor out those i, k, and a, a i k and a j l from here so that we're left with uh, 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 i i j. So that means that we would need to replace delta i j with an expression uh, made up of the rotational matrices. And you remember that a transpose of rotation matrix is its inverse. So we actually could write out delta i j as AIK times AJL times delta KL. And because of that, you see we have AIK times AJL as 
uh, factors in both of these. And so uh, we will be able to write it out as simply AIK times AJL times uh, something that we know very well. Uh, this is uh, the moment of inertia tensor. Or we can write it all out in terms of the um, matrix form. Uh, so this is a matrix I that will be equal to uh, the product of two matrices. So it will be AIK multiplying IKL multiplying IKL um, and then multiplying AJL but it's better to write it like this because in this way um, the order of uh, um, products uh, written out in components is actually going to be the same as uh, the order in uh, matrix multiplication. So um, this will be the j i j th component of this matrix. This will be i j th component. Oh, actually, I don't need a component here because I already have it all in components, right? So this is not necessary. And all of this is going to be therefore equal to matrix A multiplying matrix I multiplying matrix A tilde and all of that is I j th component. So from here all we can say is that uh, we've gotten the matrix relation uh, and this should of course have been prime, right? Prime. So uh, the moment of inertia tensor in the new coordinates is uh, um, A times the old moment of inertia tensor times A tilde. Okay, I'm going to let you out in a second, buddy. Don't worry. I'm going to see you in a sec. One, two, three. So how do we physically interpret this relationship? One way of looking at it is the following. In order to compute the moment of inertia, first we're going to undo the rotation. Then in those undone coordinates we're going to compute the moment of inertia and then we're going to rotate the coordinate system back. So this is how we're going to be able to compute the moment of inertia in the new coordinate system. Right? So if we are in the new coordinate system, let's go back to the old coordinate system. So we'll rotate it back, which is what A tilde does. Then we're going to um, apply uh, the moment of inertia tensor. And uh, we're going to therefore compute the values of the moment of inertia. And then uh, we're going to rotate the whole thing back, uh, which uh, brings us back to the new coordinate system. And uh, this is uh, what uh, we are doing over here. So what we're doing here is we do, we undo the rotation first. So we first rotate back, compute the tensor of inertia, and then rotate back forward to the new coordinates, to the primed coordinates. And uh, there are some good practices uh, for making our lives easy. So first, is we would like to work on the body frame. That means that our moment of inertia tensor is a constant in time. We don't have to worry about it changing in time, which is definitely uh, a relief. And another aspect is that we choose uh, the transformation matrix A such that our moment of inertia tensor in the new coordinates is diagonalized. What this corresponds to is choosing the new coordinate system where the x, y, and z axis are along the so-called principal axis 
of the body. And let's see that actually those axes exist so that we can always diagonalize uh, the tensor uh, of inertia. So what we want is that our moment of inertia tensor in the new coordinates is diagonal. So we need to see, can we figure out what is the right value of the rotational matrix that guarantees us that. So remember that we already solved something similar, except uh, instead of the moment of inertia tensor, we dealt with uh, two other tensors. Those were uh, the uh, V tensor and uh, the T tensor. Here all we need is that the matrix will be diagonal. And so in these new coordinates that uh, would rotate our x, y, z axis um, into x prime, y prime, and z prime, and remember that the eigenvectors um, are orthogonal to each other, and so the new axis will also be orthogonal to each other, so it's a rotation that connects the two. So once we perform the rotation such that our axis are along the principal axis of the body, we can write down the kinetic energy as one half uh, times I11 prime omega 1 prime squared plus I22 prime times omega 2 prime squared plus I33 prime times omega 3 prime squared. And that is a much simpler expression. So you can see that we can use just three numbers in order to describe the mass distribution of the body uh, for the purposes of calculating its rotational kinetic energy, the three diagonal elements of the moment of inertia tensor along its principal axis. Thank you very much for your attention. This concludes part four of our lecture 15, and I'm going to see you in lecture 16. Thanks a lot. Don't forget to do the quiz, and I'm going to see you there.